Should be any second now. I think it is. I think we're on. Hey. I think I can go welcome aboard, everybody. I'm Ron Heron, your host and vice president of the club, and I'll introduce the gang here, whoever's here on this, uh, what is it, 29th of August, year of our Lord, 2022. It is our 79th episode of the SBAU Astro Hour, a group of older fellows, retired professionals, if you will, who love astronomy, mostly own telescopes, all for the South Central California Coast, longtime astrophysics club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. We meet face to face on Zoom each Monday morning, and you can watch us on YouTube even comment, ask questions down below. I hope we can catch some of those. And you can watch any of the other 78 past issues we've done, previous programs of spanning about a year and a half on our archives, sbau.org. Uh, we're going to talk about the Artemis launch, or at least the put on hold, uh, the scrub this morning. Today is the day they were going to go back to the moon, Mars, and the other bright objects, the planets you can watch in space as one of our guys gets together on the screen here. Another meteor shower for Santa Barbara we're going to kick around. Uh, we got more of that dreaded morning zodiacal light that you can see when we don't have a bright moon. Or maybe we oh, know it again. That's right. Web uh, update, some optical history. This Friday night is our incredible September 2nd, first Friday general meeting online. And we're going to have a report or a demonstration from uh, two ladies locally. One is a uh, Dr. Uh, Rocio Kiman of UCSB, and the other is our own Chrissy Cook, as they did in a recently posted eight-minute video, along with Chuck, I understand, but he's not with us today. The president is there. He's running the show. Jerry Wilson, how you doing? Good morning. Pat Forgey, he's married to. Chuck is married to Pat, our merchandise manager. And by golly, in the bottom of my screen is Bruce Murdoch, longtime active member. Bruce, married Hello. to my wife, Bonnie, all these years. And Active member with uh, another club that he is the president of, Santa Barbara's Theater Organ Society. Yeah. One of your guys, Fred Ziesenhenny, is a friend of mine and listens to us and watches us. And here we go. Time for a little levity, ladies and gentlemen. We try to start things with some scientific fun, some laughs, and we'll see what gets called up because I got at least seven forwarded silly science cartoons and Others say, well, this is my favorite. It's all relative. Two views of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. Verifiable scientific facts. From Albert Einstein, everything is relative. Whereas uh, Charles Darwin said, everyone's a relative. <laughs> you go back seven generations, you're basically related to everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, try telling that to the red states. Uh, here we go. Uh, these are far distant galaxy. Actually, these are the Steven Spielberg aliens, the extraterrestrials from uh, uh, Third Encounters. They just built a very more powerful telescope, a way more powerful. Guys, everybody put on pants for crying out loud. Those guys are naked, aren't they? <laughs> you just never know. You just never know. Oh, and I like this one. Next step, step in space tourism, you're going to have to enlarge it a lot. Uh, if you've ever seen those Burma shave signs, I tell you, flying across America, you miss those, damn it. I kind of miss traveling in my car. Disney Galactic blast off to the Dollywood in low orbit. Uh, we got uh, six flags over Earth. <laughs> Visit zero gravity wall drugs. This, these are some of them. Moon base gator farm. How about this way to the Rocket and Roll Hall of Fame? It's going to be oh, like that. Oh, I think that's that one. Yeah. If, there can, if there can be debris out there, there can be that. That'll be the next step. Good Lord. And I'm waiting, to be honest with you, for the other countries, China and Russia, to have their own space force. All right. I'm going to just lean in and read this one. All right. The guy turns away from the uh, lens of the telescope to give them the bad news. Three guesses why we won't be coming into work tomorrow, guys. So climb under the desk. Like one of those nuclear alerts we went up with. Oh, here's one. Oh, this right. is fantasy. Every time you ever see one of those silos, those tall buildings with a dome top, it's a silo. We like to imagine the farmer's got a personal planetarium inside the very top. <laughs> or if you just cut a slot in the side, he could do a telescope observatory. But you never know. That would be some, somebody might just do that. That's great. 
Someone big, in our club, Tess, I think, or someone made a cardboard planetarium for use at an elementary school science night. It worked quite well. Cardboard? Yeah, made a big dome out of cardboard. Wow. And then how in the world would they get enough light to throw all the stars on the They put a projector up in there. This one's too complicated. Yeah, I, I, could, I was going to ask you about that one. Now, this is the upside down mirror. Let me see if I can find that. Um, Mm -hmm. Ikea, Ikea? Why is Ikea the one? Do they sell? Well, Ikea is the company that sends all those kits. Everything's in a kit. So they've got as far as assembling the parts, and now they've got to turn it over. I do know they have mirrors that can show you exactly as you look, not a mirror image. But that, uh, it's what it is, is impossible. That's why he's got a question mark there. So there is no single mirror that can do this. <laughs> and it leads to that old question that confounds a lot of people. Why does a mirror um, reverse right for left, but it does not reverse top for bottom? So remember that we talked about yeah. that a couple of months, about a bunch of months ago. So, it actually doesn't reverse right to left. It's presenting an image as the other person would see you. That's right. That's exactly right. What it is, it's the way you do, the trick is the way you we define right to left versus up and down. So mm. that is if you stick your right arm out, the arm on that side of your body also sticks out on the mirror, just like your head stays on the top in the mirror. So that arm sticks out like that. But because of um, the way we define right and left relative to our body, we turn the body around to face us, and that would be the left hand that sticks out. But it's not. It's an image of the right hand. Whoa. I don't know, gentlemen. We come up with some things. They may Somebody's going to invent something similar that'll do that. Maybe like modern-day periscopes on submarines or simply video cams anymore, aren't they? They're not. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. That's fun stuff. Uh, we all oh, wait. One more. One more. Oh, all right. Bruce, you get these, I guess. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's the prankster guy standing behind his fellow uh, uh, engineer in the lab with a dangerous nuclear. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, pop, the pop, pop, the, yeah. Preparing to put, preparing to pound on a rivet. That's right. <laughs> We're a couple I of experienced back. that <clears throat> firsthand <laughs> when we were in Hawaii and I was working on some equipment that was fully powered at 300 volts DC. And I was very careful to be around it because we couldn't turn it off. And the junior engineer was, that was with me found some of this uh, bubble wrap. And he started he started uh, popping it, and I just froze. Mm -hmm. And I pulled out. And <laughs> so I, 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 I use words that I won't repeat here. Are you are you imitating the cartoon from IKEA? <laughs> me? Yeah, you're upside down. Oh no, the one there the, where the, the guy's got the paper bag he's about to pop. I know that, but your image is upside down. Are you doing that on purpose? Well, it isn't to me. It's not for me. Wow. Uh oh. Maybe you're upside down. <laughs> See, okay, that's we'll, we'll drop that topic. Well, it's going to be kind of strange talking to an upside down member of the club, but that's all right. Well, no, he's always like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the picture that I see of myself on my uh, display here, I'm right side up. Huh. Okay. okay. On, on mine, Jerry and I are on the top lined up, and you're on the bottom beneath us. Is that how right. it's configured? There, now you're right side up. I do it. It, it automatically just senses gravity. There you are. Now you're right side up. Well, I okay. just flipped it over and flipped it back. Yeah, it got stuck uh, somewhere. Okay, um, what do you want to start with, Baron? Well, uh, let's do Artemis because that's uh, what everybody would be our breaking news. This is the day that we were going to go back to the moon and hopefully get enough money to stay up there. But uh, this time only three launches, and this sucker is bigger than the uh, Saturn V that took our Apollo guys to the moon and back. And it's the Artemis, and it was ready to launch. But what happened this morning? The 29th. Yeah, I only know what I read in the papers, or rather the iPad, yep. and uh, said they were doing a pre-ignition flushing of the engines, and one of the engines um, 
out of four, I guess number three or something, and I'm not sure the configuration. Uh, the flushing with hydrogen didn't go right. Um, I imagine it was pre-cooling the engine so it wouldn't all of a sudden get shocked by the cold of the fuel hitting it. But anyway, they didn't like the way it acted and so they scrubbed the launch. The next launch window is going to be Friday, but they haven't announced what they're, whether they're going to try and take advantage of that or not. Take advantage. <laughs> Pardon? Why is there a window? Oh, because good. things have to line up. You have to start from the <clears throat> right part of the earth. And uh, so to, for this thing to line up, if the earth's in not exactly the right position or the moon's not in the right position, <clears throat> You won't hit the moon. You won't get in the region of the moon. It's all in alignments. Okay, Jerry, but on this diagram, the, uh -huh. is, is the blue line or the yellow line, the launch? Which one is no, the launch? The launch is number one up here. See my cursor? No. But it becomes oh. one of the colors, yeah, either yeah, yellow yeah. or blue. Are you are you seeing the projection, right? I'm seeing a big figure eight and several loops around the moon. But yeah. The see yellow is outgoing, the blue is return. Do you see oh, yeah. my, yes, that's right. Do you see my cursor moving? Yep, I do. Okay, see where the cursor is now? Right. That's number one, that's the launch site. Aha. Uh -huh. Up there, see it's in Florida on the North America up there. And so then it takes off, it goes up through number four and then it disappears. Then it comes around at five, six, and you can see the spacecraft, the upper stage of it heading toward the moon. They just show the upper stage. It's lost its launch safety thing where it blows off or something goes wrong, it blows it off into space. And then it deploys its solar panels and that's the configuration they show here. Then it's heading on out toward the moon and it goes around the moon this way. 60 miles above it at its closest. Yeah. And then it comes out to 10, 11, 12. Then it makes another loop around the moon, 13. And, it's and then it heads straight back for Earth, 14, 15. And then here the capsule separates. And that goes around the other side of the Earth. You don't see it. And then it comes in and it lands off the coast of Mexico here in the uh, eastern Pacific Ocean. Wow. Off the coast of Mexico, okay. Yeah, now this is going to be an unmanned test of the equipment and everything will be operated and tested, um, even though there aren't people on it. Yes, the capsule is, is capable of containing five people and the next launch after Artemis One will be a manned mission. It will do similar things to this flight path, but it will not land on the moon. The yeah. Artemis three is the first one with people on it that will land on the moon. And where exactly it's going to land, um, it hasn't been announced yet. We don't have a launch date for that. But we know it's the South Pole. Somewhere on the South Pole. And the reason for that, they're going to try to put a colony there? They're going you know, to explore the terrain for the potential of building a base there. I don't know about a colony, but a base. Okay. Probably very similar to what we build at Antarctica for uh, research, you know, a small habitat. Because the fact is, any water that gets sunlight boils away, does it not? It sublimes away. It what away? Sublimes. It sublimes. It goes directly from solid to gas. Doesn't go through the liquid state. Oh, yeah. Right. Wow. If you've ever been to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico in the wintertime, you can, one time I went into a lab there at Sandia National Labs and there was snow on the ground in the morning. And when I came out in the afternoon, the snow was gone, but the ground was not wet. Snow was gone, but the ground, oh. So the, and the humidity was very low. I think it was like two or 3%. Wow. I felt chapped head to toe all the time I was there. I've heard that about one tenth of the level of snow would turn into water. In other words, if it's 10 inches deep, maybe it's even bigger than that. That in one yeah, that's that's solid snow because it was fluffy. That's the volume conversion from solid to liquid. 
But do you suppose uh, these uh, frozen lakes or whatever they are in the craters, you could just go out there with a chisel and a hammer and, and knock off some ice? The water, the water might be um, bonded into some kind of mineral, uh, or it's most probably ice mixed with soil. So it's got uh, some effective antifreeze in it that uh, keeps it from subliming so easily. And you think the moon got on, got the water the same way the Earth did with a bunch of comets and asteroids? I don't, I don't know how, how there's... A, I haven't read anything definitive on how the Earth or the moon got their water. I know there's uh, several schools of thought on the Earth that it was um, in the pre... It was in minerals that gradually were heated and gave it up. Um, or it happened from um, comets. But what has been sampled so far, you can tell what kind of water we have in a certain sense by the ratio of um, deuterium to straight hydrogen, that is heavy hydrogen to, uh, to regular hydrogen in the water, heavy water versus regular water. And there's no source of, no single source that we found in this solar system knowledge that matches that ratio we had on Earth. So it might indicate that it just comes from multiple sources, not yeah. one source. We might all also be able to get hydrogen out of it for fuel on the moon. Oh, we can definitely get hydrogen out of it for fuel. <laughs> you need some fuel to get it, I would imagine. You need some energy, source of energy to break apart, you know, the atoms. Yeah, the electrolysis of water is not really efficient, but they don't care. They've got lots of sunlight yeah. and solar panels. Oh, okay. Even down and and given your choices of north or south pole, they said the south pole was better. Have you seen the map? Well, of course you have. You ran it with the thirteen little locations. It's yeah, rugged. The, the candidate locations, yeah. Yeah, it's rugged there. I mean, it's like the other side of the moon that we don't see. Uh, it's not one of those vast vast plains like Tranquility Base here. Yeah, it's landed. Yep, yeah, it's rugged. That's why they're still trying to figure out where to land. Well, uh, before we totally go, I don't totally understand what flushing with hydrogen is about. To me, hydrogen is a, a fuel. Is it, did it go bad? Did it leak in the rocket? I don't know. Um, the uh, flushing is that they run some hydrogen through the, the fuel. Hydrogen is the fuel. They run it through the engine parts before they were going to ignite it. And it it didn't flow right. Well, they could have had, you know, high humidity air in there and, and some of it yeah. froze into ice. Yeah. They've, they've had storms there at the Cape. And in fact, five of five lightning strikes over the last few days. Well, they, they did delay the launch an hour. Um, they interrupted it for an hour about midnight last night. because oh. of a lightning storm nearby. But then that passed and they resumed the countdown. Well, now I notice on the sides are two of those big long candlesticks that uh, the shuttle used to have on the side. Yes. It's big exterior tank. You remember those? Yeah, those are solid uh, propellant boosters, and those are the same ones that were on the space shuttle program. Okay, so that's solid. Uh, what uh, aluminum? No, it's. Um, I don't okay. know. It's a solid fuel, but I don't know what it is. <clears throat> I think it's aluminum. I think aluminum is very, very flammable or whatever when it's well it's a compound that contains aluminum oh okay. or else it's a mixture that contains aluminum but again i don't i don't know the uh, you see the space you see the space launch system up here and you see the center part is orange like the center part of the um, space shuttle booster was and that's also a um, hydrogen tank so this would have oxygen this will be or would have been the first flight of that new rocket? The first flight, yes. They've tested the rocket laying on its side several times, but they haven't flown it. Okay. And they're going to sacrifice that giant lower stage. It goes away. We don't get it back like this. Yes, yeah, so this is not a, a SpaceX type booster. Wow. SpaceX has a, effectively a, a better or not a better, a bigger or something in this size category that will do this job, but it hasn't been allowed to fly yet. Wow. 
I keep seeing the director of NASA. He's a good old boy being interviewed, and he really laid it out. After we land in the third uh, launch a couple of years from now, we're going to try to stay there if we can keep the money flowing from Congress. Oh, yes, yes. And it's going to, it's most likely to keep flowing because if you haven't noticed, there's a new uh, military need for the space race. Oh. Military always wants to take the high ground, and China is, has been excluded from a number of our efforts as a collaborator. So they've, they're starting on their own um, space program. They're building their own space station. They just put up the second uh, of three parts of the space station. And they're also planning to go to the South Pole of the moon. And they're building equivalent boosters to this. So there is a space race and it's these good old space races that cause us to get our butts moving. Wow. Well, I'm predicting someday they're going to find something buried under the moon's surface. <laughs> and we're going to have to do a cover story about a, uh, let, let's see, a pandemic on the surface of the moon with the people. Right. Right. Anyway, I think I saw that in a movie. Well, one day they may dig up Alice Cramden up there. <laughs> <laughs> to the moon, Alice. <laughs> All right. So three steps. And it took 10 to get there with men on the surface with Apollo. Wow. But it's been about 50 years. It's amazing. Since then, yeah. This All is right. much more expensive. And this, this time they're not going to go with the same philosophy we did back in the 60s, where it was a one-time effort. We took everything with us like a backpacking trip, we packed everything in our packs and went and came back. This time they're going to build a structure, an infrastructure around the moon and on the moon. So it's not just uh, go pick up some dirt and come back. So they're going to build a gateway orbiting station around the moon. Okay, and they're gonna bring the air in tanks or try to get their own air there somehow out of water. Yeah, if there's water there, they can they can generate their own uh, atmosphere there. For breathing, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Is, is Elon Musk going to be involved at all in the future on in this? Oh, any yeah. of this? SpaceX? The Orion yes. capsule is, isn't it? This, uh, this method of the um, space launch system, this big, big rocket that is non-reusable, is very expensive. And yeah. Elon has broken completely new territory by having these reusable boosters. And his large booster for the Starship is going to be reusable too. And so I imagine, I have no inside knowledge, but as soon as the um, space launch system uses up its hardware that it's developed, they'll be using all of Elon's stuff, assuming that it um, passes all its tests and everything and is successful. So right. it's, it's a better way to go. NASA has got, it'll save a lot of money uh, by using reusable boosters. Sure. But I mean, it's complicated enough just to get one of those suckers off the ground going straight up without falling back to earth. But then to have it come backwards landing, I can't, I just don't understand how they do it. Well, he they, was, uh, go ahead. He, 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 he probably, you want to say, something? say again. Fine. I'm here. Oh, uh, just when you were, I thought you had to say something. Well, no, uh, but well, I you did. know, when the when the booster comes back down, it's lost most of its weight. It was used that was the fuel that was used to get it up there, so it doesn't need the uh, same amount of rocket power to land. It's much reduced. But part of the launch going up is aerodynamics. You know, that's how airplanes are designed: uh, least uh, friction and and, and force. But this sucker is going backwards, landing on its tail. I don't understand without tumbling. You follow what I'm saying? How in the world? Elon must own some incredible patents. No, the, the rockets are steerable. Okay, rockets, with side, with side they're rockets, they're, right? They're steerable. Okay. So they have a control system. They keep it pointed the way they want it to point. That got rid of the fins, didn't it? Remember that growing up, all the rockets had fins we saw in the future? Oh, yeah. No more fins. They were on the V2, but don't really need them. Okay, fascinating. We'll be next week. We'll probably get to talk about the one that launched three days earlier, hopefully. Yeah. If, they, right. if they go for that Friday launch window. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube and you want to leave something down, do you have the ability, Mr. President, since you're running the show, to 
check out comments and questions? I believe so. Um, learn to do that. Tim Crawford may be weighing in if he's watching us. He's one of okay. our other members. Uh, we're missing Tom Whittemore and Chuck McPartland today. They're yeah. they're on assignment. Hope they're not in Space Kennedy spaceport. But shall we talk about the planets and go on board your talking points for August 29th through September 4th? Uh, the only one we have is Mars, which is out there uh, with the Pleiades. Overnight, just slightly brighter than Aldebaran, magnitude 0.9, and Mars is magnitude zero. That's a little brighter. And um, this is out in Taurus, the red eye of, of the uh, Taurus, the bull. Red planet sits 11 degrees above Aldebaran, 21 and a half degrees below the um, uh, his so belt. This, this yeah. finder chart, this planetarium program developed this chart for August 31st, which is Wednesday, right. at 4, 4 a.m. And you can see that Mars is in Taurus near the bright red Aldebaran. And I believe there's another red planet. Yes, Betelgeuse down here. The, the, red, the red things are roughly lined up. And uh, this, so this is in the morning. And it's a good view. This is the Pleiades up here with, um, I, I set the program to show the names of all of the stars, the, the bright ones and the named stars in Pleiades. So, um, Tegeta, Sterope, Pleione, Alcyon, Atlas, Maia, Caliano, Electra, and Merope. And Electra, Merope, and Alcyon are the only ones I can remember from a standing start. So, so this is what's happening in the morning star, sky for Mars. Now, Mars is not near opposition, so it's not that big. Some oppositions, it gets to be about 25 seconds of an arc across, and that's a really big opposition for Mars. Um, Jupiter is about 50 arc seconds across, so Mars never quite gets to what Jupiter looks like. But still, it's a nice uh, size, and at every opposition, you can, uh, if there's not a dust storm on the planet and you have the right equipment, you can see uh, features on the surface of the planet. It's also quite red. Yeah, that's why it's one of these red three things in a line. So Betelgeuse being below this uh, means Orion is underneath all of this. And yeah, Orion, this is toward the horizon down here. So Orion comes up later. This is our preview of the winter sky coming up in the morning. In uh, December and January, this will be in the evening sky. They're the bright stars of the winter constellation. Wow. Aldebaran's been getting a lot of uh, exposure lately on our Monday broadcast. He, it shows up. Is it a red giant? Yeah. Okay, so it's another Betelgeuse just a little further away, you suppose? I don't know the distance to that. I'd have to check on that. Okay. Uh, th this one, this is the uh, other bright planet thing. Oh, is this like this right? No, this is. That's the uh, next part of your talking points if you want to go there. Yeah. Ursa Major, the bear, and... Oh, I, I, I jumped one. Oh. Well, you tell me where to go, and I'll join you. This is the other bright planet. There's no paragraph written for that. It's just uh -huh. a, another finder chart for bright planets right now. This shows Jupiter over here, and Saturn... Over there. Bruce was out looking at these this morning, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, I was, about 2 a.m. What did you see? Oh, there it is, right there. It's hidden in some other stars. That's see Saturn. the hand of my cursor? Huh. That's Saturn in Capricornus. And this is Jupiter in um, Cetus, right on the border with Cetus and about to enter Pisces. So this is... The, um, this is the southeast, and this is at midnight. So Mars was an early morning. Um, to see it this far above the horizon, we had to look at 4 a.m. These are now transitioning into the evening sky. So this is uh, 12 o'clock at night, midnight, the witching hour. Uh, it's visible farther to the east. It's farther. It's moving up this way. 
rises in the east. And so it's moving this way. So earlier, like at 10 or in the evening, it would be down around here. So you can start to see these things in the evening sky. They're transitioning in my words and my view. Would you gentlemen know if uh, during history, hundreds of years ago, uh, they would probably have spotted Saturn, but they didn't uh, see the rings until we got telescopes. Is that a fair statement? That is. Um, Galileo was first to see the rings, but he never knew what he was looking at. He thought that it was a planet that had like jug handles on it. Or ears. Yeah. Or ears, yeah. I, I heard that the whole thing uh, from one end of the one side to the other, including the rings, would locate between the Earth and the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a quarter of a million miles almost, so yeah. sucker is big. Would be a disaster for the Earth and the moon, but yeah. Well, I wasn't, yeah, right. <laughs> I put together a graphic of that. I probably could pull it up here if I can find it. <clears throat> that's also, you know, when they when the spacecraft, I forgot what it is, New Horizons, whatever the one that went around the backside of Cassini, wasn't it? The one on yeah, the backside Cassini. of uh, Saturn. They discovered a new ring that they couldn't see from Earth because it was so faint, yeah. so sparse. And with that ring, that's about the same mm -hmm. diameter as is the distance from the Earth to the moon. So I put together a graphic that had the Earth and moon to scale on that, uh, on that uh, photograph. So you really get an idea of the, how big it is, how big the system is. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it took four days for Apollo's spacecraft to get to the moon. Is that about as long as it'll take the Artemis, you think? Or are they going faster these days? Um, it, See, I guess I can't share as long as there's something on the screen here. Let's try that. Oh, wait. Okay. Go ahead. You're on now. Uh, let me go find it. Um, oh. I'll put it. Uh, I go to my big computer here where I can easily look at things and find the number of it. Can you share uh, it with us? I will as soon yeah. as I find it. Oh, okay. I'm not, I got to get to the right place here. Get into astrophotography and fire astrophotos. There we are. Well, we're at an incredible time in many ways. Bad times in some ways and incredible good times and Number 116, let me uh, astronomical. We'll find it, share. Okay, where are we? Well, what, while you're looking, why don't I just bring up real quickly, if you don't mind the meteor shower we may get from the Origa, Origa. Origa. Origa, got it. it we should be in the middle of it, but we've uh, been notoriously let down in meteor showers recently, so. I don't know if you have pictures, but um, Ariga is the um, charioteer. Yeah, I don't know how to do this. I'm still. Bruce, I'm, I'm going to go back and share some things, and when you get yeah, because I can't, I don't, I can't uh, get into my directory on here where I want to share. Okay. It. All right. <clears throat> Neither can I, but I'm not even going to try. All right, we're back to the sky with Jupiter again. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, uh, the inner planets, mm -hmm. are, where are they? Mercury and Venus. Oh, Mercury is low in the West and Venus is in opposition or con conjunction with the sun. So you can't see it. That's what opposition means. It's on the far side of its orbit from us. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sometimes That's, um, superior conjunction. Ah, uh, superior conjunction. No, opposition doesn't mean on the other side from us. Opposition means it's opposite the sun in the sky. And it's and Venus is not and can never be in that position for us. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. I misspoke. Okay, here we have, um, this is the Polaris, the North Pole. And it's showing the W of Cassiopeia over on the right here. The W, forget these two lines here, <laughs> and you get the W, and then you get the um, Big Dipper over here on this side. These are this is this has the uh, Milky Way going through it, and this one is surrounded by galaxies because it's you know almost 90 degrees off from the, uh, the significant 
number of degrees off from the Milky Way. So you're looking out into deep intergalactic space. But <clears throat> for Santa Barbara here, uh, these are always in the sky. Right now, they're opposite each other. They're always opposite each other. Um, Cassiopeia is rising and um, the Big Dipper is setting. So this is going down and this is coming up. Um, and so you can, but you can look from objects, they're both rich in objects to see great places to look. This particular configuration is shown on August 31st at 8.30 in the evening. <clears throat> so I picked a time when they're almost, they're at exactly the same altitude above the horizon, <clears throat> which is shown way down here. So that's a good thing to go out and look for. Well, is the Cassiopeia W ever represented as a chair? Yes, that's supposedly a chair. Oh, or, she's upside uh, down sitting in it. Yeah. Huh. It's also represented sometimes as a rock that she's chained to. Oh, uh, that's kinky. Yeah. I can't see that designated on the interior of our planetarium wall, but that's all right. Oh, I've seen it on some planetarium things. <laughs> For the beach. <laughs> now, this is, this is the morning sky. This okay. is 2 a.m. on August 31st. This is the uh, constellation of Araga. And this is the um, centroid, no, the uh, radiation. It looks like where the meteors will come from. Um, they all radiate from this point, but you'll see them all over the sky. If you see any near Auriga here, they'll be short, short ones because they're coming right at you. If you happen to see one that's coming exactly right at you, it will just be like a star that turns on, is there for a few seconds, and then it's gone, or a few part, fractions of a second. Over here, the ones you'll see <clears throat> are much longer streaks. Now this, this uh, uh, the RE GIDs have started already. They will peak on September 1st. Uh, what is that, Friday? Thursday. Thursday, Thursday, yeah. So they'll peak on Thursday. This is the Northeast, this is East. Uh, so in the morning and between midnight and uh, sunrise, that's the time for, uh, for to look at this. It's well suited for us this time because there's no bright moon in the sky. The moon will be a thin crescent in the evening sky. So it will be dark unless you have city lights and <clears throat> it's well positioned. So you wanna be from um, midnight till probably four o'clock. We're on the front edge of the earth. And so we're, we're high, flying into the storm of meteors. It's just like going through a rainstorm with the raindrops all accumulating on the windshield and then over the back window. So looking in the evening, you're all going to see the few, the few meteors that can catch up with us. And probably, yeah, well, that's, yeah. So this one, we, we see a lot more meteors probably because we went into them. Comments, Bruce? <coughs> but no. they, 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 <coughs> they, they, the, uh, new and improved ahead. LED streetlights, it kind of wipes out my viewing from my deck. I got to get away from them. Do they, they name them after... Uh, past comets that have left their trail. Oh, they, don't. they they name them out of where their radiant is. Oh yeah, right. That's what I meant to say. The Leonids, for example, is Leo. Yeah. This was Auriga, but why is that? Why don't they name them after the comets? Because they didn't know until very recently which comet they came from, and oh, people at first come? didn't even understand that they came from comets. Huh. The Perseids, uh, what uh, constellation is that? Yeah, I don't remember which, const which uh, well, the Perseids is from Perseus. Perseus, oh, okay, obvious. And Leonids is Leo, okay. Yeah. So sooner or later, they're going to get a group in the same constellation, and they're going to have to come up with a new name for the second, say, time of the year that we hit a trail. They've already got that. Oh. They, I forget what to do with it, the fall whatever it is, or the spring, whatever it is, they sort of just add another uh, adjective on. Ah, fantastic. Or a Greek letter. Yeah, <laughs> or a Greek letter. Now, since the moon is gone, the skies can be dark. Here we go. Uh, we can see the zodiacal light, which is what this is. 
This is sunlight scattered off of dust in the solar system, and it's concentrated in the plane of the um, ecliptic so that you get um, this ellipse of light that goes along the zodiac, called the zodiacal light. Took them a long time to figure out what this was from. It's a rare event It's because it's very faint. You have to be at a very dark site, and I have seen it before at dark sites, particularly at Calstar, and wondered what city that was, because sometimes you can see lights from cities far away and wondering what it was. And then I realized it was the zodiacal light. But we see it better uh, during the autumnal equinox. How about the uh, spring equinox? Um, I don't recall that. Okay, well, autumnal is coming up in about three weeks, isn't it? September yeah. yeah, we're headed for that. So at new moon next month, uh, there will also be an opportunity to see the zodiacal light. And is that, uh, that's the Earth's uh, surface at the bottom of that photograph? Yes, you can see uh, a glint off of um, some water surface here. That's so there's time exposure. And then there's mountains and there's a little streak of light there, either another glint or a freeway or something. But there's no real big cities off here. It's a little light there, little light down there. It's a very dark site. If, if you see the zodiacal light, it's a dark site. Okay, but if we were viewing it from here and we were seeing that, what would it be over? The Pacific? Yes. You think so? Yeah, don't quote me on that. Bruce, <laughs> you know, this is where Chuck would come in handy. Yeah, well, Chuck has got a dental appointment. Well, it's going to be opposite. It's going to be, it'll be in the east, right? Because the sun has to be behind you to be able to see it. Well, this is this also scatters off of it. Um, right, but if it's forward scattering, you're you're blinded by the sunlight. So this well, is actually is set, the sun is set here. You can see the I sunset. Understand. Okay, so this is scattered. We're actually looking forward then. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, so that's west. All right. So are we looking at just after sunset or just before sunrise? Hmm. Good question. We'll save that for next time. I think your this notes. Is, your, your notes. A, your notes say sunrise. It could okay. be either. Yeah. Because okay. all it takes is the sun to be obscured by the earth, yeah. <clears throat> but the light is still coming up high and illuminating the dust. I guess I should read my own notes. Well, uh, the question then uh, hangs in the battle. Maybe somebody watching us could tell us. Uh, yeah, this was taken um, um, 5 a.m. Okay, so it's just before, but that's not east. Or well, that would be where the sun's rising. It's the sun's right below it and behind it. Right, Unlike, but at 5 a.m., the sun is about to rise. Yeah, so the sunlight is illuminating uh, things next to it or on the way between it and us uh, in the zodiac, in the zodiac, or what's the word I'm looking for? The ecliptic. Yeah. The plane of the solar system. So it's the exact opposite of the phenomenon known as a rainbow, isn't it? Rainbow is always in the other side. So rainbow is a completely unrelated effect. That's I understand it. that, but it involves the sun. And, and some light we see, obviously we see the colored spectrum, yes. but it's always opposite. This was, this would yeah, mean- Because it's caused by reflection off raindrops. Right. There, are, there are effects that are similar to the zodiacal light that are inside the atmosphere. You can see rings around the sun called sun dogs. You can see uh, rings around the moon. There's a lot of superstitions about what's gonna happen next, but um, that's where the light comes. It, bounces off of ice crystals in the upper atmosphere, and then it uh, is scattered down to our eyes. So huh. there's, there's analogous phenomenon. But the ecliptic, the plane of the ecliptic is full of dust. Um, Ex-meteor showers that are waiting to happen, the um, smashed up asteroids and meteors that have come to turn to dust. But the ecliptic means the sun is directly over the equator? No, the ecliptic is a line in the sky. It's like, it's what the um, I'm sorry, plane of I, planets I meant, are. I meant the equinox. I know what the ecliptic oh, is. Oh, the equinox. I meant equinox. No, the equinox is when the sun passes, the sun is tilted from the, or rather the Earth's orbit is tilted 
from the plane of the ecliptic, you know, the, in the solar system. And when the sun passes from north of the ecliptic to below the ecliptic, that's passing through an equinox. It just seems to me the summer and winter, uh, what are those called? Um, solstices. Yeah. Are when the sun goes uh, north that's or south. passes, yeah. But I would think the equinox is where it goes back to the middle, which would be the equator. But well, it, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and, and that has. We'll get a diagram for that next time. All right, you're on, my friend. Thank you. Okay, we got about uh, twelve minutes to cover. Uh, oh, Webb, can you get to that? The first CO two detected by the Webb telescope. They're making this sucker work. Yeah. It's Wasp. 39b exoplanet, they gave it a name, 700 uh -huh. light years away, it orbits a sun-like star, and as the planet transients, you want to tell us about this? How do they get to see? Yeah, stuff? this is the, the, the sunlight that comes, or the starlight that comes through the planet's atmosphere as it starts to eclipse the sun, or occult, or occult that star. Got to stop saying sun, it's not ours. So um, they... This is in the um, its wavelength of light, three microns on the right, on the left, I mean, over here, and 5.5. So this is mid wavelength. This is um, short mid wavelength, but this is all part of the near IR camera on the James Webb. And the, there's a known spectral band for CO2 absorption here. And so that light, when the when the planet starts eclipsing the sun starts eclipsing the star, that frequency of light is taken out of the starlight, it's missing. And so that's due to absorb absorption by CO2 in the atmosphere of this giant hot planet. Now this planet is very close to its star. Um, it's a gas giant. Yeah, it's a gas giant. And it's 700 light years away but it is it's an oversized Venus is what it is, but the size of Jupiter. It doesn't say how close it is to the to its own sun, unless I missed it. But it's fairly close. Yeah, they're finding those big suckers, those Jupiters and Saturns of other uh -huh. systems, finding them up close. They didn't think like don't think they thought they could be that close without what dissolving away or burning away. Oh, they probably are burning away. They uh, some of these Jupiter giant hot Jupiters they're called are orbiting around their stars in days, and this, they are probably blowing a lot of atmosphere away unless they have very strong magnetic fields to hold it in. Hmm. Well, um, at, on earlier talks. Like the last one. Time for history. We what? talked about ancient observatories and the fact that in the old times, all they could do was point a stick at a star and measure the angle, the altitude and the azimuth of the stick. And by that, they made their first maps of where the stars were and tried to correlate and tried to measure the motions of the planets, the wanderers, as they call it. But <clears throat> it turns out that people have been playing with lenses from as far back as AD 1000, but they didn't develop telescopes till the, till the early 1600s. The, the things they, they had in the AD 1000 were, was a glass sphere, and they called it a reading stone. When you laid it on something, it magnified what you were looking at. So it helped them read things when their eyes were feeble. Um, a uh, guy named Salvino Gamal, an Italian, is credited with inventing the first wearable eyeglasses around 1284. And by the early 1400s, eyeglass makers were flourishing throughout Europe at the time. So, um, the, uh, with the exception of primitive eyeglasses, the telescope was the first real optical instrument to be made. The uh, origin is surrounded in con controversy, but the most likely scenario is that uh, Dutch eye maker Hans Lippershe in the, around 1600, his apprentice put a um, positive lens 
at arm's length and a negative lens much closer to his eyes. And when he aligned the two, he could see things with about a 4X magnification. And he realized what he had. He made a tube and they played with it. Um, Hans took over and filed a patent application for the telescope. They called it a, um, what do they call it? A looker. They didn't call it a telescope. And uh, uh, Hans' patent application in Holland was denied because this was, this was really a top secret military weapon. And so, um, because it, it could show you what your enemy was doing on the battlefield where he couldn't see what you were doing and you could see what his was doing, but their security was just down the tubes because all of a sudden um, these things were made and passed around even though the patent wasn't filed. And they got into the hands of Galileo in 1608, I think it was, 1608. Yeah, they were called lookers. And uh, so he got a hold of one. And um, um, in 1609, Galileo had experimented with these combination of lenses and constructed several lookers based on Lippershey's model. And the description he had received from a fellow named Sarti. <clears throat> And nothing Galileo had accomplished till this point was noteworthy. But this was the first, and he turned his, his looker, he made it, he had these lookers for military use primarily. And, but he turned these lookers on the sky and he started making notes of what he saw and sending them around and giving talks on them. And people were quite incredulous, but they had access to these things too. And he showed them what he saw and they saw it. So he gained credibility and notoriety. And so he had to have several um, command performances, you might say, from the Pope. And they got into a little tete-a-tete -tete about what it might mean. A lot of the thing about him putting, putting under house arrest um, against his will, this sort of um, melodrama. They they came to an understanding about how how carefully the church the church did not deny what he was seeing, but they wanted it cut his words couched very carefully, so it didn't cause a disruption to believers. But that was the first scientific uh, use of the telescope, and in future shows, um, we'll present a little bit each time about the evolution of the telescope. This was very similar, a very simple telescope, um, not anywhere near acromat achromatic performance. They had a lot of false color. They didn't focus very well as just the fact that Galileo, when he used it on Saturn, he couldn't see that the rings were rings. He thought it was a planet with um, ears. And he was never able to resolve it well enough now, when they made these things, they didn't use any of the techniques that we did for testing. They didn't have the Foucault test. They didn't have the Ronke test. There was no real way to make it. What they did was they made roughly, they knew they had to make a sphere somehow. And they would grind it, grind things together, which naturally they do it right. They tend to make a sphere, a bulge and a, and a um, convex surface that matched. And they would make a bunch of these lenses and then they would just look through them and see if they were any good or not um, by putting them in a telescope. So they only star tested. And then they would uh, block the thing down. If it didn't work well, they'd blacken out the outer edge until they um, and reduce the aperture until the image looked good. And if it was too small an aperture, they'd just throw it away and try again. But it was trial and error about getting a good telescope. You can see his workbench here is covered with lens. Um, they try. They they sort of mined the the product by lying for um, for the good ones. Is that Lippershe or is that? Uh... This is a, a a drawing that represents Hans Lippershe in his uh, workshop. You said at the beginning of your uh, uh, your sta statement there that uh, positive lens and a negative lens were put yeah. inside. Uh, is that the difference between concave and convex? What makes yes, it convex is a positive lens and a concave is a negative lens. And the, the old style? Sure. If, if, you're if, if you're nearsighted and you want to see things at a distance, 
your eyeglasses are negative lenses. Oh. If, you're, if you're farsighted and you want to get reading glasses, your lenses are positive lenses. They're convex lenses. Wow. Doesn't seem to be. They all seem to be bulging somewhat. They're all curved because you're going to look in different directions. But oh, right. the curve on, on a positive lens, the curve on the front is more bulgy than the curve on the back. So it's thicker in the middle. On a negative lens, it's thinner in the middle. And then old man Benjamin Franklin came along and put them both together in one set of wire rims, didn't he? I heard that was a mouse. A mouse? That invented <laughs> bifocals? No, I'm just referring to an old Disney cartoon. Oh, okay. Got I can't it. blow this up any bigger. It's a, it's a grainy <laughs> photograph. I know. This, I've, all right. this is a replica of, of Galileo's first telescope. It was a positive lens up here and negative lens at this end. And the reason for the tube is that you can't really hold them apart nicely and gently and still. It's like looking through binoculars, isn't it? Yeah, you have to you have to keep the two lenses aligned. Your hands are not going to keep them aligned. It's gonna, uh, I'm having trouble with that too. But it keeps them aligned, and then at night, especially, it blocks out stray light, so it gives you just the contrast in the image. Well, you gentlemen have noticed, have you not, that the web has no tube. And I'm wondering if that's going to be the future of telescopes. All of them nope. are going to have curved Our, mirrors. A lot of telescopes don't have tubes. Um, the Almar telescope doesn't have a tube. The Mount Wilson telescope, big telescopes don't have tubes. Of course, they're well, they have a in there. structure that makes up the, they need to hold the secondary mirror somehow. Right. So they have a truss structure, but it, <clears throat> it lets a lot of light in. Yeah. Now, the secondary mirror is the thing on the pole that sticks out in front of the big wide mirror in the yeah. back. Yeah. Well, it either sticks out, if it focuses it to the side, then it's a Newtonian. But if it focuses back through a hole in the main mirror, then it's a Cassegrain. And that's what uh, most of the big scopes are. Okay. They're Cassegrain. Well, well they that's... also have prime focus. The focus cage, the uh, astronomer can climb up into it and directly expose his uh, film sheets to the, uh, that's called the prime focus. So for hundreds of years, we had two lenses, one concave, one convex mounted in a tube until we finally got to today's telescopes, as you're describing. Yeah, since it was a long series of developments. Um, the next step of after um, Galileo's telescope was to make telescopes very, very long. Um, you'd have like a four inch objective, diameter objective, and the scope would be over a hundred feet long. And that was because you get rid of a lot of aberrations with the long focal length. You get rid of false color and you get rid of chromatic and, or that is from it, you get rid of uh, spherical aberration. So um, they made telescopes that produce better images, but they were very, very cumbersome and very difficult to use. More on that later. And yep. then uh, Fraunhofer made the first achromatic telescope by using two different lenses up front. And we'll get to that. But that took out that he developed the achromatic lens. So there's two lenses in the front. And then eyepieces at the back end of the telescope started becoming achromatic too. The basic idea of a telescope is that the front lens makes it a tiny image of the object. And then the, the lens at the back is a microscope that examines that tiny image. And Leeuwenhoek, Van Leeuwenhoek gave us the microscope. Did he invent that after or before Galileo did the telescope? I think that was along in these lines. Yeah, it wasn't, um, it was after, I think. We'll have to look into that. That's a good point. Okay. He used a water droplet as the lens, though. Well, I'm that initial round glass stone or whatever it was in the year through uh, 1000 is, fascinates me. How did they make those? We'll talk about that too, I guess, gentlemen. Yeah. Well, they would they would grind and grind that. But let me just have one more point that <laughs> that's my my wife calling me. Um, <laughs> the um, the um, eyepiece very small eyepiece that Newton used in his first Newtonian telescope. And the really small eyepieces that occurred at that time were made by dropping molten mass into water. 
and it made little beads of glass. And then they take beads out and try them until they got one that would make a good image. Is that right? That's how it's done. I get real short focal length lenses. Very fascinating stuff, gentlemen. We'll definitely have some great times to talk in the future. I guess we're down to the end, but uh, Artemis launches Friday, perhaps. So we'll have that to talk about on Monday, uh, which will be the 5th, I think. Uh, yeah, next Monday. In the meantime, uh, yeah, Friday night, uh, join us online, uh, or at least watch us on YouTube, uh, Bruce, because we're going to have the latest on the web, and there's lots to talk about. That's delivered by Chrissy Cook. And oh, yeah. uh, her friend and ours from uh, the university out here, I guess, Rocio, I heard, is moving to L.A., but she's still going to be part of our our talk. On the yeah, she's at UCSB, and she's going to move to Caltech. Oh, Caltech, just like Adrian, our former vice president. Yeah. Well, thank, you, thank you, gentlemen, and take care of yourselves and uh, keep warm or cold or whatever, and good luck to you, and thank you for joining me. We'll see you next Friday night. Um, Jerry, I sent you two uh, images, the ones that I couldn't find. Okay. <laughs>